Welcome to Module 7. This is where you're going to learn about advanced editorial tools from a leading industry expert. I'm going to start by introducing our guest expert, and she's going to talk about push versus pull in enforcing style guides. Then we're going to move on to demonstrating one advanced editorial tool called Acrolinks. Then we'll explore the use of advanced tools in industry. And finally, consider whether advanced tools will replace editors. Let's begin with introducing our guest expert. Val Swisher is the founder and CEO of Content Rules. That's a consulting company in California. She manages their content strategy, global content strategy, and content optimization services. Val has more than two decades of experience, and she is a well-known expert on global readiness, intelligent content, and Acrolink software. She speaks frequently at industry conferences and is a sought-after guest on webinars and podcasts. She's written three books, including Global Content Strategy, which we assign to students in our undergraduate content strategy course. She's also a member of our department's advisory board. This graphic appears on the Content Rules website, and I thought it would be helpful in showing you the types of consulting projects Val manages. For example, she helps companies develop a global content strategy if what they know is their English content isn't working, or they need to translate but don't know where to begin, or their translation costs are too high, or they know their content quality isn't acceptable. Here's one example of the kind of large company served by content rules. Rockwell Automation is a U.S. company that designs and produces industrial automation and information technology. They own brands like Allen Bradley and Factory Talk Software. They're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They employ over 23,000 people and have customers in more than 100 countries worldwide. One of Content Rules' partners is Acrolinx. That's a company founded in Germany by experts in linguistics, specifically natural language processing. Val's going to show you what the software does in just a few minutes. But first, she's going to explain the concept of push versus pull as it relates to style guides. So I want to talk about one concept, which is push versus pull. Most companies that do not have a tool like Acrolinx. Um, well, if you don't have a tool like Acrolinx, you're always using what I call a pull method of getting style, grammar, terminology um, to your authors. The pull method is this. I have a style guide that's a PDF file. Maybe I can search it. I have terminology that's in a table someplace. Maybe I can search it. But in order for me to know the rules, I actually have to stop what I'm doing and go find it. I have to pull it. Okay. And if you think about it, for terminology in particular, I'm writing, right? and usually I'm like, it's 6 a.m., the lights are just so, the caution tape is across the cubicle, like don't bother me, I got the headphones on, I'm in the zone the writing zone, and I get to a word, and I have to stop, and I have to think to myself, is this a managed word? Am I allowed to use this word? Should I be using a different word? I don't really know. Sure. And then I have to stop, and first I have to find the word, the term list, right. needle in a haystack. Then I go to the term list, and there's no guarantee this word is going to be in there. Sure. And if it's in there... It, it's in there because I'm allowed to use it. I might be looking for something that doesn't exist, right. which happens. It's not going to happen. No, this is the secret. The secret about style guides and terminology is that no one ever uses them, ever. We spend man years creating them and polishing them and publishing them and updating them, and nobody ever uses them except for the first six weeks that I'm an employee right. and I put it under my pillow. 
Because I don't have the time. I have a deadline. Right. If you expect me to stop what I'm doing and look something up, it ain't happening. It's not going to happen. Right. The only way you can enforce your trademarks, the only way you can enforce your terminology is to push it, to push it to someone. Meaning if something magical happens and it is sent to me, you're not allowed to use that word. Here's the word you're supposed to use instead. Just click on it. Poof. Magic. Gotcha. And the only way to enforce it is via a push technology that delivers that each and every time without fail. Gotcha. And so that's a really important point that it's, it's very disheartening when I say to 400 people at a conference, no one ever looks at your style guide. It's, no. it's a waste of your time. And they're all like, we know, it's terrible. We're so upset about it. What can we do? Yeah. So it's important to understand this difference between push and pull. And pull doesn't work. Nobody has time for it. Right. Right. And I have to think about it. I'm in the zone. You know, when I was a writer, I don't know if you had this experience, there would be times when I was a writer where it's like everything around me was almost fuzzy because I was in the zone. I was explaining what an IP address was. Right. You know, this was important. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm old. I, that's what I wrote about back in the day. What is an IP address? And why do you care? Right. Um, I did not have the bandwidth in my brain. To stop and think about. So I think it's an important concept to understand and to be able to explain. Yeah. Because it's, it's so obvious. Do you want it on time or do you want it right? Because you can't have both. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. So technology is the only way to help with that. Great. Now that you understand the advantages of pushing style guidance to content creators, let's watch as Val demos Acrolinks for us. Uh, today I'm going to demonstrate Acrolinks. Acrolinks is a content optimization tool. Sometimes we call it a spell checker on steroids, but as you'll see, it is much more powerful than any spell checker or grammar checker that is out there. Acrolinks is an enterprise class op uh, application, and it's best used across the entire enterprise so the content is consistent, high quality, uh, on brand, at the right level of, of reading level, et cetera. And there are two sides to Acrolinks. It's a client server system. And I'm going to show you both the client side and the server side. And it's always uh, interesting for me to decide which side to show first. But I think today I'm going to show you the client side first. And then I'm going to take you behind the scenes into the dashboard just for a little taste of what you can do on the dashboard uh, and where the magic actually comes from. The client side. This is a standard Microsoft Word document. There's nothing up my sleeves. There's nothing different about it than any other standard Word doc. It's just a short little Word doc. And the thing about Acrolinks is that it interfaces, it has a plug-in for pretty much every authoring environment that you might ever need. With Word, when you open the review tab, what Acrolinks does is it, it inserts itself into the review ribbon. And it works this way in every tool. Either there's a menu with a drop down for Acrolinks that's uh, inserted or some icon someplace. So it's very, very easy to find. Can I, and when I click... Sorry, can I interrupt for just a second since you brought it up and ask yeah. you for example, what those other authoring environments would be? Oh, sure. Um, there's, let's see, Oxygen, uh, Xmetal, FrameMaker, Excel, um, uh, Google that's, Docs, okay, that's uh, InDesign. Good. Okay, you got it. That's, that's good. I clicked on the Acrolinks uh, button up here, and it loaded 
the sidebar in the screen. And I'm going to make it a little bigger here, a little bigger here, so that you can see it. And from a user point of view, everything that you need to do to check a document is all contained within this little sidebar panel. And there's lots of different things that you can configure in here. Um, there's different options that you can configure. Uh, you can tell it what it is you want to check in the document, what language, different profiles. It can get, uh, it can get complicated if, if you wanted to. And there's also a variety of things up here that I'm going to show you as well. What we're going to do now is we're just going to check this document. And all I have to do is click the Check tab for it to check the document. And what it's essentially doing is it's comparing this document to the way the software has been configured. And it's looking for a variety of different types of issues. It's looking for spelling issues, grammar issues, style issues, terminology issues, clarity, conversational tone, and uh, I guess we turned on acronyms, which is in beta, but hey, we turned it on. <laughs> and when you check the document, it goes out and it finds all these different, uh, all these different issues. And it makes a little card for each one, and they're color-coded. It also gives you a score. So the score of this document is 71 out of 100, which means mm, it's not the worst document. It's not in the red, but there are a bunch of things you could do to make it better. If I click on the score, it actually takes me to the scorecard or report card, and it shows me all the different things that are wrong. So it tells me, oh, I've got three terminology issues, and I've got two spelling issues, and a couple of grammar issues. And as I go down, it actually shows me every single issue that's in the document, along with possible uh, suggestions for how to fix it. So every time you do a check, you, you get a scorecard. Question? No, just a comment. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Okay, so it gives you it gives you a scorecard, but if you're actually authoring or editing, the scorecard is great, but having this in line with every single error is even better. So I'm going to filter this right now so that we're only looking at, let's just look at spelling and grammar and style errors. Okay, so what all that did was it turned off some of the cards so that I could see what's here uh, a little more easily. And the first error, it says, is, hmm, this is too long for a title. It's 11 words long. Now, this is a threshold that you can set in the software. So if you have a product that is eight words long, obviously your titles are going to be more than 11 words long. But it's telling you that you should try uh, shortening the sentence. So I could go in and I could edit it, uh, publishing, well, let's see, what should I say, is essential to the growth of every business. Okay, so I fixed that one. All right. Do, do, do. Okay. Next, I'm going to go in and it says, oh, could versus couldn't. <laughs> it just it just fixed that for me. <laughs> so it went in and there and it fixed it on its own for me before I got a chance to uh, to show it to you. But basically, that was a grammar issue of whether or not uh, you're going to allow contractions or uh, force contractions. And in this one, it wants you to use contractions. Here, I'll do this one so that it doesn't actually change it beforehand, it turn out. So this is an error in, uh, in the sentence. It shouldn't be as it turn out. It should be as it turns out. And I could just click on this like I did last time, and it would just drop it in. I could also say uh, ignore it. I could say ignore it once, ignore it all the time. If there were multiple instances of this, I could say fix it in all instances. But I just click on it, and then it 
it fixed it up here. So you go through the cards. This one is a sentence that's too long. It's 41 words. That's a problem. You need to fix that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the famous serial comma, right? You need it before the word and or or. Wars have been fought. Spelling errors. It catches. Grammar, it's it's, it is, right? And it always takes you to the part of the document where the error is found. And I can click when it knows what the error correction is, it actually lets me click on it and it will drop it in Great. for me. So pretty simple. Where it gets really nice and fancy is under terminology. Terminology is, uh, is a place where um, it really gets more complicated. So terminology is something that, again, is configured on the server, and I'm going to show you where that is. Basically, what you do is you tell the software what terms are preferred, what terms are deprecated, meaning you're not allowed to use them, and what terms are admitted, meaning you can use them sometimes but they're not necessarily preferred. And the first instance we have here is someone who spelled the company name wrong. <laughs> we at Smart Tech. Now, Smart Tech would not show up as a spelling error because it's not in the dictionary. So it has to come in in terminology. And basically, again, I can just click on it and it's going to drop it in and move on to the next error. Here's where it fixed it. The next terminology error it found is the word because. And it's saying, you know, don't overuse this word. It's usually unnecessary. However, if you really need to use it, you can. So you can add notes and do all sorts of things. You can even say, um, instead of using due to the fact that, the preferred word is because. So, you know, you can really do whatever you need to do to make your terminology exactly how you want it to be. And I'm going to show you where all of that gets set up. Terrific. And finally, let's take a look at tone of voice. Tone of voice is, um, is interesting because tone of voice looks at full sentences or paragraphs to try to analyze them, to try to see, gee, this one is very dry. So not only that, it's also noted by more than 70% to blah, 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 blah. it's also too long, but it's also very dry. And it's just trying to say, you know, liven this up a bit. For another example would be uh, when a sentence is too complex. So it's not only too dry, but here's a sentence that's also too complex. So maybe it's too long. Maybe you want to break it up into a bulleted list. And also you have a lot of ING words that you need to, to pay attention to and be careful of. Same with uh, phraseology, boils down to. Well, that's jargon and it's overused. So it's suggesting that you might want to do something else here. And it essentially goes through your entire document error by error, card by card, and it allows you to change things. It tells you what to change when it knows what to change. You know, it gives you all the information that you need. And if you ever don't understand what a card is saying, you can always go out to the online health system. And here's our favorite serial comma. And this is what it is, and here's what you shouldn't do and what you should do, and this one's pretty easy, but sometimes they get pretty esoteric in terms of the kinds of errors it finds. Absolutely true. So, uh, so again, um, I can check in any, really, any kind of authoring environment, and it's really going to find all kinds of things that I have set up. And there's other fancy things like it will it will find new terminology as it goes along. I mean, there's all kinds of other features, but we don't have time to to look at all of them right now. But these are the basic ones, and really, 
when I show you the, the, the dashboard in the back end, you'll see why this tool is so critical to most corporate environments. Great. All righty then. All right. So this is the Afterlinks dashboard. And this is where everything is set up and configured and controlled in the brain of the system, if you will. The things that I want to show you today, let's first look at the, uh, the rules, the guidelines. So we're using essentials. Okay. We're using Afterlinks Essentials for the U.S. So the system comes with I think it's 110 different rules. Wow. And this is where they get configured. And for each rule, I can enable the rule. I can disable it, meaning the system won't check for it. And I can say, check for it in, in this context or don't check for it, for it in this other context. I can also have uh, the threshold. So for example, the title, we saw uh, title too long in the document we checked, well, by default, it said it's seven words, but I can change that here. What we do is we take a customer style guide and we compare it to the standard guidelines. Okay. So uh, it'll find things like a space is missing, there's an extra space, you should make this an ING verb, Maybe you should add the word to because it has an object. Do you mean a or an because you got it wrong? Advice or advise, access or effect. Uh, do you mean amount or number? I mean, there's all kinds of things here. Is it capitalized properly? You know, and I can turn them on and off. And then if there's a rule that we uh, that our customer needs and it's not in the basic set there are other rules that can be customized and added in but i will tell you that these 110 rules really cover a lot of it gotcha. they really really cover it another thing that's really interesting is that i can have multiple sets of these rules so for example I might have a different set of rules for marketing content than I do for technical content. I can have, I mean, look at how many rule sets we have or guidance, guidance packages. Uh, they used to be called rule sets, so I still call them rule sets. I mean, we've got lots and lots of them. There is a point where you have more than, <laughs> than you really need, but we yeah. usually work with customers to figure out what they need. If you don't understand what, uh, what a rule is, you can always click on it. It takes you to the online help system. It gives you a lot more information in here, general guidelines, collected nouns, all kinds of things, and it always gives you examples. It is very thorough. It is very thorough. And part of the key is that it's very configurable. I mean, really <sighs> configurable. Can I ask a question about the, the style guides that it works with? Yes. So sure. one of the things, of course, that this is a tech editing course that I'm teaching. So one of the things that I'm doing mm -hmm. is teaching students about different style guides um, and why mm -hmm. they exist. Uh, and mm -hmm. we will talk about it in detail, but we do talk about standard technical English. Yes. And I would think that you would have to have software in order to implement that. Is this something that Acrolinks would do? Yes. So it's a very good point and a very good question. Um, a couple of things around that. If you're going to use standardized technical English or simplified technical English, uh, there is an, a rule set, a, a separate rule set that Acrolinks has that implements just, you know, those rules. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. It's very, you know, it's it's very limited in what you can say. I mean, the terminology that you're allowed to use is, last time I checked, there were 1,500 words that you were allowed to use. So At one point, you know, 900, I think. So uh, it, it yeah. used to be 900, and I think they, they, ooh, they increased it, <laughs> you know. But yes, um, there are also other rule sets if you 
only want to use, say, the Chicago Manual or the AP Style Guide, what we found over time, Acrolinks has been around for over a decade, um, what they did in the Acrolinks Essentials is they took some rules from the Chicago Manual and some rules from the AP Style Guide and even some rules from the Microsoft Manual of Style. Right. And really, over time, through analyzing you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of corporate style guides came up with this list that seems to be the most common uh, cross-section of them. Excellent. Let's also look at terminology because terminology is another place where, uh, you know, editing can be very, very difficult without a tool. It can be difficult without a tool even if you've memorized the Chicago Manual of Style, but ter right, the terminology is particularly complicated. And what Acrolinks does is it allows you to store all of your terminology. You can store multiple languages. Uh, you can have them in different states if people have to work on them. And just like I can have different uh, sets of, of guidance, different rule sets, I can have different sets of terms and I can check my document against a specific set of terms. Gotcha. So we're using a, a set called Smart Tech and when I click on it, these are all of the terms that are in the uh, domain Smart Tech. I'm going to show you a little bit about them. First, I'm going to group them by term entry and you'll see what I mean by this. Okay. So we have client, consumer, and customer. Now, client, consumer, and customer are often interchangeable. But if you really want clean content, if you really want to be able to mix and match, so back to our client, consumer, and customer. When you write in a structured environment, one of the most important things you need to do is standardize because if I write a section and I refer to a customer as a client and another one is a consumer and another is a customer and I put them together, it can be very confusing for whoever has to read through all of that content once I've, I've built my end product. In addition, I really only want to translate this one time. Right. I don't want to have to translate customer, consumer, and client. So what I've done here is we've said we always want to use the word customer. And any time you see the word consumer, you need to flag it and say, no, 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 that's not the right term. You need to use the term customer. Same with client. If I were to click on client, for example, it says that the status is deprecated. If I go here to link terms, it says not only is the status deprecated, but it's linked to the preferred term, which is customer, and it's also linked to another deprecated term, which is consumer. Similarly, if I go to customer, it's linked to the two deprecated terms. And I can have all kinds of linguistic information, advanced information, um, administrative, I mean, there's all kinds of information that I can have with a term. But the thing that I find most useful is when a term is linked. So I've got, you know, terms that are grouped here, and we know um, you need to spell acrylinks properly. We know that we don't allow the term enable. Instead, we want you to use admit, right? So there's, there's just, it's just so highly configurable gotcha. that um, the other thing about using a tool like Acrolinks is that it pushes the corrections to the writer or editor. And I think that the push technology is the only way to really get compliance in terms of terminology and style and grammar. Oh, Otherwise, we're really doing best effort. We're yeah, really absolutely. doing best effort. Especially in an um, age when everyone's creating content and it's not, going exactly. through, it's not going through one office. Exactly, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, that's why across the enterprise, 
if you have one group writing your technical documentation, another group writing your technical training, and a third group writing your knowledge base, and oh my goodness, we can't seem to, you know, get anyone right. to use the same word two times. But so, the, consumer, um, the consumer doesn't care that you're in different departments. <laughs> exactly. The <laughs> consumer really just wants to read the information and get on with their lives. Right. It's really what they want. You know, there's lots of other things that the software has. You get graphs and charts and bar charts and all kinds of things. Right. And, who's doing what and you know who checked when and what was their quality score and there's other there's to, uh, tone of voice that you can have there's all kinds of other other things that the software provides it's, right. it's very complicated but i think that really having a good understanding that tools like acrylinks or congri or hyper ste that do this kind of of work they're highly customizable and highly configurable and then they're incredibly easy to use. Right. So the user side is nothing more than clicking a card and, and moving around, right? So, you know, it's nothing more than, you know, show me my errors and, and we're good. Um, it's the back end that really has all of the complexity. And that's what's great is to really keep the complexity away from the people who need to use the tool. Excellent. So yeah. that's a little bit about Acrolinks. I hope this is helpful. It was awesome. It's awesome. I, I knew that it would yeah. be powerful, but it's more powerful than I realized. I think that it's an excellent thing for our students to know about yep. in the future. I, I agree. And I now that you know a little bit about how Acrolinks works, Val's going to help us explore why companies invest in tools like it. Could you start by helping us understand a typical client for your company? So a typical, and I, what I mean by typical is somebody who would perhaps be interested or could get interested in purchasing a product like Acrolinks. Sure. So um, we work with all kinds of companies and we really work with uh, all different size companies. But I think that the companies that get the most value from a tool like Acrolinks are the larger companies. Uh, certainly, it's really the larger companies that can afford a tool like Acrolinks because it is an expensive tool. Can you give me um, a range? I know you're not going to, I mean, I'm sure it differs, but can you give me a ballpark? It's about $100,000. Okay. Which is what I, am. So, I anticipated that, but I think my students will be surprised. So, uh, Listen, my customers are surprised. Yes. <laughs> you want me to spend what for editing software? Right. The key to really using a tool like Afterlinks to get the most out of it is to not limit its use to one group. Right. Usually, it's the techcom group, the technical publications group that sees it and goes, oh my goodness, this is the answer to so many problems. But really, what, what we really want to do is try to standardize some of the language across techcom, training, support, knowledge base, um, marketing, digital marketing, sure. when we can really start... Uh, all using the same words to describe the same thing. And then when we can start speaking with that same voice, whatever that voice is, right. then we really can solve a lot of other issues. We can promote the brand. It causes less confusion, fewer support calls, all these things. Sure. So um, I would say that most of my customers that, Purchase a tool like Acrolinks. Uh, and by the way, there's another tool called Congri that is very similar, that has some additional features. Um, most of them are large companies that have, I would say, at least, usually at least eight or ten technical writers to okay. start with. Um, as soon as you have more than one, you really need it. But yes. It, you know, at least more, more, you know, at least 
eight to ten is is common. Okay. They may or may not have human editors on staff. Okay. Uh, they may have human editors on staff whose roles can then change once they implement the tool. And we could talk about that more. And I have unfortunately seen companies have editors on staff that eliminate okay. editors because they feel it's a mistake, in my opinion, but they somehow feel that they don't need editors right. because they have software when it's really not that way. Right. But, um, and I, you'll find it in high tech, in software hardware, you'll find it, uh, this, these tools in finance, in manufacturing, um, less likely to find them in pharma. You might find them in life sciences. Okay. That has more to do with kind of the rules of writing in pharma. Pharma writing is really unique, um, but still could be used in pharma. Sure. Um, some companies start with marketing groups because of the kinds of analytics you can get. Sure. Is it the case that they adopt the software and then start thinking about how they can use this with the non-writers in their organization? Or are they thinking about the, I mean non-writers, I mean the people whose job role is not specifically writing or editing. Do they think about that before or do they think about it afterwards? It depends on the company. So when you have a company that is very SME driven, is very engineering driven. Right. Um, sometimes we'll have a company, I, I, lately I've worked with a number of companies where they actually don't have writers doing the writing. Right. They really have engineers doing the writing. And then the writers are doing coordination, collating, sometimes um, the editing to smooth it out. Sure. They realize very quickly that a tool like Afterlinks is really um, something they can't live without. Right. Because uh, a lot of engineers are great at coding, but sure. they, they can't write a straight sentence. Sure. You know. Yeah, this is a um, common. Also, it, it, it is. It is. And um, Afterlinks becomes indispensable to making sense out of Right. And when you have a tool like Afterlinks, what ends up happening is that let's let's say um let's say your company doesn't allow passive voice. Well, I'll tell you, if you're the SME writer and you have to fix passive voice again and again and again and again, eventually you learn to write in active voice. Right. So sure. it trains them. It also has been very good training um writing teams that are offshore oh okay with people who have english as the second language sure uh, i've seen some really good results there and again it's the editing and the teaching them kind of at the same time right it's um, both a training tool and an editing a quality assurance content tool exactly exactly so some companies see it and know right away oh my goodness we need this because we have this group of people that are writing, they're putting they're words together in a yeah. row. Um, companies don't see it until they have it. Yeah. Because That's they have, have a assume. writing team and yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Am I correct? You can tell me if I'm correct. The, where does the idea, where, who pitches the idea of Acrylinks? So does it come from the writers, I'm assuming? They know about a tool or they know they need help. It's not often the writers. Ah, okay. And I'll tell you why. Because no professional writer wants to say, I need help with following the style guide. I need help with following the terminology. Okay. Um, even though we know that having a style guide that's, a PDF file or terminology in a Word document or an Excel table never works because nobody has the time to look anything up. 
We don't have the time to stop what we're doing and look and see if a word is in the terminology. We just don't. It's usually management okay. that, that it's usually the first level management. Okay. Sometimes it's, a little, it's even a little bit higher up the food chain. And I feel the most successful deployments are when we really have like a VP level person yeah. who sees the value across different parts of the organization. Sees the value that if I fix the English source, my translations are going to be much better and cheaper and faster and right. you know less confusing. Right. So um, it's rare that I see a writer who will admit to not having memorized the style guide. Right. So because it's such a significant investment, I'm guessing you would need somebody at the VP level to agree or somewhere farther up the chain than first line management to approve a purchase that is six figures. Um, uh, but what is the, you've already mentioned a couple of things that might be reasons that they would pay attention in terms of return on investment for that six figures that they lay out. But could you just go through kind of a list of those yeah. things? Yeah. So, um, I think that particularly in TechCom, the most compelling argument to put in a tool like Afterlinks really is its impact on the cost of translation. And when we do an ROI, a, a return on investment calculation, that's really where we find that bang for the buck. Okay. I mean, I have customers, if you translate a lot of content into a lot of languages, you could have you could have made all the money back within a year. Okay. Okay. And from then on you're saving money. Right, exactly. Okay, so, so that's a very um, short term. That's a very yeah, that's a very short term turnaround. It is, it is. So sometimes it takes up to two to three years. It depends upon how much translation you do. Sure. Sure. But that's usually the first um the first place to really be able to grab on to uh, a return on investment. Um, for as long as I've been doing this work, I have been trying to get a calculation that says, if the documentation is, is made better, if we improve the quality of the documentation, the cost of support goes down by this much. Someone tell me the cost of a support call, engaging with a person on the phone or even in a chat window, and tell me the percentage of calls that are, are caused by content, documentation that a person has problems with. Sure. And then, if you can tell me that, and I can figure out, okay, well, how much does that cost and how much does, you know, how many do you have and all that, then I can say, oh, well, if you put in Acrolinks and what you wrote actually made sense to somebody, then you would get your payback in this amount of time. Sure. I, I have yet to find a customer that is willing to disclose this. I do know, though, that years ago, probably eight years ago or so, I was working with a customer who I won't name, but they made um, small little routers, kind of like a small office, home office routers. And they would include an extra $2 per device for support calls. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. Yes. It's a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot. They would, they would include $2 per device. Now, are the support calls uh, caused by poor documentation? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Are they caused by people not being able to find the documentation they need? Yeah. Very likely, right? I can't, I can't do it. I don't know where to look. I, I looked online and it took me more than three seconds. Right. I'm just going to pick up the phone. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, I do know that more and more companies want this self-sufficient. Everybody wants their customers to be self-sufficient. Sure. You know, the cost is, is enormous. Um, but you know, there's there's a 
correlation there, but usually when we get to that conversation, we have to flip into the quality of content, confusion of customers, what's yeah. the cost to the brand. Right. Right. You know. Right. Um, companies that have uh, SME authors are now starting to recognize that um, that the content that the content needs this kind of help as well, software-wise. Okay. So uh, that's another time. Or offshore teams, large companies that offshore the bulk of the writing. Okay. Uh, when you look at the cost compared to the cost of an editor, the cost of the software, depending upon where you are, it costs about two headcounts ish. Okay. Ish. I mean, depending on where you are and. Right you know, the, the amount people get paid there and the benefits and everything else. So one and a half to two editors. Okay. So um, there have been times where, gosh, I have 300 offshore writers. How many people editors do I need to manage that mess? Sure. Gosh, I could just put in the software. That's going to save me a boatload of money. Right. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. And when, when, when times were hard a few years ago, you know, the, the great, recession, uh, it really was, gee, I can get rid of how many people? Yeah. I just put in the software and I don't pay this for the software every year at that right. cost. The one time. You know, it's yeah. one We're time or even if it's a subscri subscription, it'll still be lower than that. Right. So yeah. Okay. So those are those are some of the places where okay. I think um they look for that kind of ROI. Okay. That's great. To wrap this lecture up, we're going to consider whether artificial intelligence is going to replace editors. Before we go back to the interview with Val, it's worth noting that artificial intelligence, like the technology behind Acrolynx, has become increasingly capable of processing human language. And Acrolinx is certainly not the only advanced technology used to increase content quality. The names of some other popular ones appear on this slide. You should be aware, too, that AI is used to create content as well as edit it. For example, Philip Parker, a marketing professor at the European Business School, INSEAD, had authored and published over 1 million nonfiction books using AI way back in 2013. Similarly, robo-journalism has been mainstream since at least 2015. The Associated Press uses something called Automated Insights Wordsmith platform to create more than 3,000 financial reports per quarter. That was as reported in 2015. At the same time, Forbes was using something called Narrative Science's Quill platform for similar efforts. These AI writers can handle highly predictable content like a sports story about a hockey game. All right, so maybe one of the fundamental questions that I would like to hear you try and answer, or answer, I think you can answer it, is what types of editing is best done by Acrolynx versus what type is best done by a human? Acrolynx is great for the rote mechanical copy editing. Did you use an Oxford comma or didn't you use an Oxford comma? Did you, you know, did you put A-N before a word that starts with a vowel? I mean, the really rote things that can easily done, be done by software. Right. Um, your sentence structures, your grammar, those kinds of style issues. And the, the, among the reasons that machines do it better, they, they don't make a mistake. They don't miss one. Right. You know, a human editor, I mean, how many commas are they going to look at before one or two get by them? It's just going to happen. Sure. Is it the end of the world if you miss an Oxford comma? No. But it's that kind of rote editing. A tool like Acrolinks does its best work on a single sentence. Okay, gotcha. And it can tell you if the sentence is written correctly. 
it can tell you a certain amount about a paragraph from tone and style. Okay. It cannot tell, you can have plenty of grammatically correct sentences that make no sense. Sure, sure. It can't tell you if the order of your sentences makes sense in a paragraph. Okay. It can't do the developmental editing that I think is so critical, sure. which are things like, I have six documents that are all installation guides. Are they parallel in structure? Do I always start with what's in the box? Sure. Followed by, you know, I don't know unpacking the box, followed by quick, quick install, followed by whatever. Sure. Because from a, a content suite point of view, um, even chapter by chapter, do my chapters, do they flow in a logical order? Um, do I have a sentence over here that's referring to something that hasn't happened yet, but it's saying, as we previously discussed? Right. Because if I'm looking at something on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis, I don't know what was previously discussed. Right. So anything that has to do with the structure of a single document or a suite of documents or a corpus of documents much better done by humans okay and we're much better off spending our editing dollars on that level of editing of does our content make sense it does it flow right right is it you know is is it holding together is it glued Right. And letting the machines do the rote, also terminology. Terminology yes. is great done by machine because I have customers that have thousands of terms in their terminology, thousands. And there's just not a human who can possibly remember that. Right. And the amount of time it takes for an editor to look up terminology you, you've wasted a lot of money that way. It's another way to get at your ROI, by the way. Okay. It's like, how much time do we waste looking things up? Right. It should be pushed to us. Right, right. Okay, that's excellent. This has been so helpful, Val. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I, I am very grateful for your willingness to talk to us and for My your pleasure. involvement in, um, in our programs. It, it makes a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Um, to our oh, students. Oh, good. I'm glad. So. I'm really glad. Anytime. I'm happy to help. I started this lecture by introducing our guest expert, Val Swisher, CEO of a content consulting company called Content Rules. Val introduced the difference between pushing and pulling information from style guides. She made the case that pulling simply doesn't work. Next, we watched Val demonstrate the use of an advanced editorial tool called Acrolinks. Acrolinks pushes style guidance to content creators. We then listened to Val answer questions about the use of advanced editorial tools in industry. She noted the cost of these tools means that they are used in many industries, but almost exclusively in large companies where there's enough return on investment to make it worthwhile. Those organizations adopt Acrolinks because their leaders recognize the opportunity to increase content quality and cut costs associated with things like translation and customer support. Finally, Val explained that advanced editorial tools, at least for now, are best working at this sentence level, what I've called mechanical and stylistic editing in the course, and that human editors are needed to deal with logic or order of information or parallel structure across related content types. There are no advanced tools for structural editing, especially when creating unique rather than predictable content. That describes much technical information. It should be no surprise that this is the type of editing of highest value in both traditional and non-traditional publishing. So I think the message is that for now, there are no tools that can take the place of a structural editor. Anybody who can deal with content and organization 
um, is going to remain in demand. But I also want to repeat something that I think I've said several times already in the course. It's so important that tech editors, like tech writers, be able to explain the business value that they add to the organizations in which they work or the clients that they work for. Mm -hmm.